Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are meeting yet again to hear about our 17th president, Srimati Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. A great personality, a multifaceted, dynamic lady. Uh, when you start reading about her, you don't know what she left. Like, what, what, she was into everything. What she did not do is difficult to see, you know, because she was uh, doing everything possible. And today, I'm sure uh, we are going to see all the facets of her personality, all the aspects of what her activities were about, right from freedom struggle, social activism, craft, theater, drama, embroidery. I mean, the list is endless. And today we are going to meet her uh, in this webinar uh, of uh, AIWC, organized by AIWC, perceived by our president, uh, Srimati Sheila Kakareji. And uh, this webinar uh, is going to be about our 17th president, Srimati Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. Before we start the program, because today's program is very heavy, it's going to be, you know, uh, multifaceted like the personality herself. And uh, we are glad to welcome the relatives all the time. Every time we have this webinar, the relatives, uh, they, you know, help us by joining us. They throw more light and we get to know more about these ladies. So before we start with the program, I would request our president, Srimati Sheila Kakneji, to throw some light on this uh, program and how you came about it. So over to you, Sheila Ji. Thank you, Yutika Ji. Namaskar and welcome to all my dear sisters and the guests who have joined in today's webinar, taking us on the virtual journey with All India Women's Conference in its teens, 17th year of her existence, along with the most dynamic president, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, in the year 1944, who served AIWC in the first year in the capacity as Secretary General and also Treasurer and continued as Secretary General for four years till 1930 with four different presidents. Uh, Maharani Chimnabai Gaikwad, first president, uh, then second president was Begum Saiba of Bhopal, third president was Rani of Mandi, and fourth president of AIWC that time was Sarojini Naidu. For the benefit of our guests today, I take the opportunity to tell a few lines about AIWC. All India Women's Conference is the 94 years old national level organization established in 1927 by Sarojini Naidu, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Dr. Annie Besant and Margaret Cousins, an Irish lady having made India as an adopted motherland with Maharani Chimnabai Gaikwad second of Baroda as the first president. Having its office, head office, now at Sikh Bhagwan Das Road, New Delhi. The education and position of women in British India needed a lot to be improved and the formation of community of women to work towards improving the status of women was the need of the hour. Chosen representatives of the conferences held all over India in 1996 in response to Margaret Cousins' call, attended a formal conference in Pune on 6 January 1927, and All India Women's Conference was established. Women and girls from all classes and creed were encouraged to avoid child or early marriage and get formally educated. Women of stature such as Viceroy of India, Lady Irwin, Vijayalakshmi Pandit, Rajkumari Amrut Kaur, Srimati Rameshwari Nehru, Lady Rama Rao, Maharani's of Bhopal, Mandi, Travancore, Dr. Muthalakshmi Reddy, Hansa Mehta, to name a few, were the stalwarts of this illustrious organization who very actively participated in the independence movement by Gandhiji also. AWC rose further along and gained consultative status with the United Nations and at national level also. Institutions like the Lady Irwin College, New Delhi, Cancer Institute, Chennai, Family Planning Association of India, Amritkar Institute of Mentally Challenged Children, Old Age Home at Vrindavan are few among many others pioneered by AIWC 
which are now autonomous bodies in India. All India Women's Conference also brought upon many legislative reforms in India, including the Universal Adult Franchise, Hindu Code Bill, Maternity Benefits Act, Sharda Act, etc. AIWC at its own level runs projects and programs implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. Regular crash programs and primary schools are run in the branches. Working women's hostels are also being run. AIWC also has short stay home for distressed women at Vrindavan and at head office. And 10 more branches also run this program called Bapnugar. Our three trusts for education, health and senior citizens also run separate programs. National Integration and Communal Harmony in collaboration with National Foundation of Communal Harmony and Peace is being offered as program to AIWC's vast network of branches numbering around 500 plus all over India with dedicated membership around a lakh and plus. Other programs conducted are various health checkups, anemia programs, socio-economic programs for empowerment, looking at the need of the hour, lot of awareness programs on gender sensitization, sexual harassment and legal awareness, environment and climate change, renewable energy, water and waste management are conducted on virtual platform very regularly. During the pandemic, our members spread over the country, extended their helping hand towards the needy in every form, food, medicines, sanitizers, oxygen cylinders, vaccination support, providing accommodation for the medical doctors and paramedicals, etc. AWC branches have provided counseling to the mentally disturbed in this COVID situation also. Under Environment Protection Program, our branches take up tree plantation in rainy season. Recently, our South Zone A, comprising of Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry states, have launched a program of Planet Abundantly Green with the initiative of our Joint Secretary Supriya Balerao with the help of Forest Department. Very recently, one of our Kakinada branches youth club bagged first prize from Ministry of Youth Affairs at Make and Keep Their Village Rampalem Clean and Beautiful. Before I hand over to Yutikaji to proceed with the program, I must express my gratitude to Mrs. Vajra Rao, ex-president of Mangalore branch, for giving me the con contact of Mrs. Arundhati Chattopadhyay, granddaughter-in-law of Kamla Devi and my school buddy from Mumbai. And also Mrs. Kripa Shetty, standing committee member of Mangalore branch to do the presentations today. I also appreciate Mrs. Nina Menon, Kamla Devi's granddaughter and grandson, Mr. Neem, for active participation today. Professor Josna Tiwari ji, I thank you for joining today to throw light on important achievement of our versatile president along with Dr. Yutika Mishra. I'm sure you all are very eager to listen to each one of the speakers. So now I ask yes. our moderator of this series of past presidents, member in charge library, Yutika ji, to move forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Shiladi. Thank you for throwing light on the activities of AIWC and its presidents. So let's move forward with the program. I welcome you all again to uh, the, the session on the 17th president. And let's hear uh, the first speaker for today on the agenda is none other than the grand daughter-in-law and grandson of Srimati Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, Neel, Neelji, Namaskar, and Arundhati. Neel and Arundhati Chattopadhyay, we welcome you to this program. And we are all ears, we know, uh, I, how can I forget the way you were, you know, you even helped me. I have to tell this before we start that when we used to discuss this, uh, who's doing what and there should not be repetitions because there was so much about this lady you know she's so dynamic I, I, like like four lives can come out of one life that's what i always felt so it was very difficult to cut out this that and thank you so much arindhati for guiding us through and yes. i now hand over the mic to you 
over to you for your presentation on knowing amma neel and arundhati chattopadhyay you can share your screen if you are muted uh, this is a lovely presentation they have i can uh, assure everyone some very you are muted pictures. arundhati unmute yourself unmute yeah unmute unmute okay. please okay okay there you go okay so here we go i uh, title this knowing amma you know i'm from the same community as kamla devi was we are the chitrapur sarasvat and all mothers actually the first word that we learn as infants is amma so we always call kamla devi amma and though i met her when i was 19 there's another little story in between which my mother told me which is fascinating i must have been 6 months old and neel and i are the same age so obviously he is 6 months old and my mom my parents put me in a pram and took me for a stroll in this lovely little garden near babunath it is the babunath corner garden and my mother remembers seeing a beautiful dynamic lady with a gorgeous sari on and flowers in her hair and pushing another pram and i'm sure neel was in the pram because she was holding hands of a little girl and i'm sure that girl was neena and our path crossed at that moment and much later when i met kamla devi i told her about this incident and she kind of looked up hmm could have not too many comments from her but when i was 19 i knew her vaguely because she belonged to our community the chitrapur sarasvat but i had seen pictures of her with pandit nehru sarojini naidu mahatma gandhi and the other freedom fighters of that period and i heard my grandmother tell us stories of her bravery during the independence movement along with the songs they sang during the prabha phase samla devi belonged to an era when women were shut out of mainstream society however her mother dirija akka was a thinker ahead of her time and supported the rehabilitation of widows and fought for other social reforms in women's education and equality it was in this atmosphere that samala grew up and became an independent strong willed woman she of course was a champion of women's rights she has been a political activist an author a theater person and the ultimate authority on indian handicraft and folk art a truly multifaceted gem of a woman her generosity towards struggling artists musicians and craft people is unparalleled it is hoped that all the work she put into in and that she will be remembered for generations to come as the mother of the indian handicrafts movement let's begin our journey mangalore must have been very much like goa in those years beautiful riverways forests woods and in this atmosphere on april 3rd 1903 to girija bai and ishwar 
Kamla made her appearance in this world. G. Venkatachalam, who was a very close friend of Amar and a scholar and a philosopher, in his book, My Contemporary, describes her birth very poetically. She opened her baby eyes to a world of peace and plenty. Nature, too, was all smiles. Bright blue sky above, rich red earth below, and shimmering green of sea and land all around. And yet, her infant kids, her mother would tell you, were unlike any other baby. They were more vigorous and violent and more powerful and persistent. She was not a docile daughter, even as a baby. Kamala attended St. Anne's School, and uh, Mrs. Prakashati told me that school is still thriving in Bangalore and the city famous. And it was run by a Jesuit order, so the nuns played a major part in her growing up. Discipline and instilling time <coughs> is something that Amma cherished all her life. I remember in Bangalore, if someone would send her a car, she'd be ready at the gate 20 minutes before and pacing up and down, and we'd be all nervously following her. It was quite a scene. She learned the piano, an unusual choice of instrument for that time. Gilda Bai hired a private teacher from Abdul Karim Khan's Hindustani Music Karana to teach Kamala vocals and Sarangi, an instrument predominantly played by men. The teacher was, of course, so ambitious that without any base, he started her on learning the khayal. I think Girja Bai got really nervous and decided Kamala must have was her foundation. For the first time, I was learning the roots and intricacies of Indian music, writes Amma in her memoir, Inner Resistance, Outer Spaces. As an adult, she loves all kinds of music, and smoke gets in your eye, but clatter was one of her favorite songs. So all of you, after my talk is over, go on Google or YouTube and check this song out. Kamala and Girija Bai's hardship followed when Anantaya suddenly died. No will was found and the entire estate and wealth went to Kamala's stepbrother, whom she hardly knew. This incident etched a deep impression on young Kamala's mind and she decided to take up the cause of women's rights later. Girijaka and Kamala's grandmother knew how to read and write and were instrumental in introducing incredible books to Kamala. Amma loved to read a variety of books at a time. I remember her bed, her side table had always books and books and books. Her relaxation was reading authors like Agatha Christie and James Harden Chase. And also, she loved reading biographies and, you know, like Martin Luther King, etc. She always, always had this file next to her bed. I remember that. She also had a writing pad and a pen next to her and scribbled thoughts and events all the time. She spent much of her time writing her books in longer hand. As Kamala grew up, she was only 14 when she married Krishna Rao. But the marriage lasted just for a year as Mr. Rao died suddenly in 1990. But her in-laws were very progressive and she was allowed to finish school and then attend Queen Mary's College in Madras. Suhasini so Chattopadhyay was her classmate. And this is where she met Harindranath through the Chattopadhyay family. 
and the courtship ended up in their marriage. They both were passionate about theater and music and traveled all over India, writing and performing. Kamla Devi divorced Harin in 1955, which was very unusual for a woman to take that stance. And even though the marriage ended in a divorce, they remained friends. In fact, am I used to say, Harin still makes me laugh. On May 19, 1924, their son Ramakrishna was born. But everyone called him Ram. And they set up a home in Bombay. Harin and Kamla's involvement in the freedom movement and their commitment to Gandhiji kept them in and out of jail. So for several years, Ram grew up with his grandmother and aunt. That's Sarojini Naidu there and Kamla Devi next to her. And that's baby Ram on your left. War time was difficult for all, and Kamla decided to send Ram to America to study at MIT. Her close family friends and ex MIT grad, H. H. Abdul Razak, who was the principal planning engineer for the Board of Economic Warfare in Washington, D.C., and his American wife, Ellie Norden, became his local guardian. Now, I heard a talk uh, on Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit's last session, and her relative said that Leka and Sara studied in New York. Now, it must have been a small world at that time because Ellie and Raja played a very important role in Leka and Sara's life at that time. And Ram, of course, would spend his weekends in New York with them. Ellie and Raja started the club, which was for Indian servicemen who were getting specialized treatment in New York hospitals. Ram would help arrange musical functions and get together while they were recovering. Ram had an excellent voice and played tabla very well, a talent he inherited from his parents. His favorite song for years was De Same Mucho. I love the way he sang that. So these are the two portraits I found of H. H. Abdul Razak on your left. And in the center, we have our beautiful aunt, Ellie Norden. And then I found a book, Anna and the King of Sayak in our bookshelf. And it said to Ellie and Razak, with love and many happy memories, from Sara Leka Krishna. And the date is July 15, 1944. This is my favorite book. And years later, when it was converted into a play on the We have lost you, Arundhati. Arundhati, we cannot hear you. I think there's a connection problem here. Yeah? Well, looks like that. Yeah, while she joins uh, back. Will you ring up uh, Supriya? I would like to introduce them also. I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that later. But now is the time. Because uh, I introduced them as the grandson and granddaughter-in-law. But there's much more to back. Arundhati, are you back? So, Arundhati Chattopadhyay was born and raised in Bombay. She was just telling us about that. Uh, learned Bharatnatyam. Are you back, Arundhati? Yes. Okay. I was introducing you, <laughs> but okay. you want to go on, yeah? 
Yeah, resume. You can resume your talk, please. Yeah. You know, these things happen, what to do. Okay. Yeah. So we were in Boston uh, uh, when Ram met yeah. Doris, yeah. who was Eddie's younger sister. Doris was Arunati, not you, have to, you have to uh -huh. share your PPT. You have to share I, your PPT. I am. You have to share uh, the screen again. Uh, okay. One minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one minute. So we were at this slide. And really, you know, this is what happened. So we just have to be patient. In Boston, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. In Boston, Sam met Doris, who was an art major student. They fell in love and got married in America. Doris was a divorcee with two kids when she met Ram, and they drove all the way from New York to California to work in Hollywood, learning special techniques of the time. Nina, their daughter, was born in Hollywood. Ram, with his new family, returned to Bombay in 1952. At that time, Kamladini's mother, Girija Bai, was staying in Babunath, near Chapati. And Doris and the kids were welcomed by the grand matriarch with much fanfare. I believe she had an entire European menu organized for their homecoming dinner, so they would not miss their homeland food. Kamladini now realized she was a grandmother to Nina and the Whitaker children, Dave and Romulus and enjoy a role immensely. Kamla Devi encouraged Ram and Doris to start a film processing laboratory in Worley, Bombay. It was to bring the very latest in cine film coloring processing with Technicolor. All the famous directors and producers of the time used to bring their films for processing. I remember hearing stories from Neil and Nina saying, oh, they met Nina Kumari, they met Aydal Kumala, Devanan, Ashok Kumar, and all the famous actors of that time, because they would come to the preview theater and watch the rushes. And it must have been a very exciting uh, time in Bombay. And the lad was called Ram Nod. Ram, of course, Ram's first name, and Norden is Doris's maiden name. And for years, Ram Nod has been on the main road in Worley. Uh, uh, the building was designed by Doris. And it was fun for us to drive by and see that for many years. Like I said, there was a mini preview theater where Kamla Devi and Doris would host children's films for their birthdays or get together. By then, Kamla Devi's grandson, Neil, was born. The film processing lab brought back a lot of memories for Amma. She had acted in 1931 in a silent film called Ritchukatika, written by Sidraka. She played the role of Vasanta Sena. The film was directed by Mohan Bhavnan. Mohan and his wife, Inakshi Ramarao, who also was a star of silent cinema and a writer, remained close friends. I have, if you see my cursor, that's Inakshi and that's Mohan. They made a handsome couple. And I remember Inakshi very well. She wore beautiful sari and she had these penciled eyebrows, and I found them. Really fascinating. <laughs> Here is an old picture I found in Doris's album. It's Kamla Devi, who acted in a movie called Bikre Moti. Kamla Devi encouraged members of her family, especially her grandnieces, to take up music professionally. Krishna Kalle took up playback singing while Asha Putri became an international jazz singer. 
Asha like Kamla Devi learns the Sarangi, then learns into Sarangi Jai Bhogharana Hapri, then went into Jai. Grandson made Chattopadhyay, took up the electric guitar playing rock and roll music, and guess who bought him his first guitar? Of course, Kamla Devi. She had gone to Japan on a tour, and when she came back, she got him this fabulous guitar with Hami Ford pickup. And he was so excited about this guitar. Kamla Devi in Bangalore was with us for a long time on now. And we were doing a piece of music for a television private show. She would stand at the framework of our door and ask us many questions about the new machines, etc. Very curious and loved information. My next slide, I call it phase two, because Neil and I came back from America one year on a transfer of residence, and we spent a lot of time with Kamla Devi in this wonderful home in Bangalore. Seven 760 HAM second stage extension in Biranagar, Bangalore, was her home now with Doris. She, of course, had a place in Delhi, but Bangalore was her home, and she set up design centers there. Kamla Devi established Natya Institute of Kathak and Choreography, NIKC, with its founder, Dr. Maya Rao. The dining table of 760 was converted into a studio. Mr. Chandramoli, the chief natural dye master, would come in with a cloth bag full of goodies. The moment we heard his voice, Kamla Devi would be at the dining table and the experiments would begin. Baldis, dates, bathrooms, all would be brought out from the kitchen and bathroom. After many questions and trials, the final satisfaction would be seen on Amma's face. She wore the most gorgeous saris and looms with natural dyes. In fact, we call them Amma saris. Sometimes the table would be covered with a blank cloth and Amma would give us these wood blocks and ask us to have fun. Even our dog Velvet would step in the dye sometimes and leave colorful paw marks all over the house. Amma loved velvet. And when Velvet was dog napped, Amma was heartbroken. Well, Kamla Devi and I both rarely entered the kitchen. We loved looking at the recipe books, but we hardly went near any stove or did any cooking. I remember the kitchen in 760. It was fairly large, and neither Kamla Devi or I spent any major time in it. Our helper Rani tried her level best to cook. One day we yearned to eat Amchi Saraswat food. So I borrowed this fantastic cookbook called Rasa Chandrika Every Saraswat Square Saraswat from Amma's friend Lalita Ubaikar. Amma and I shot with two dishes that seemed pretty easy to make. Bataka song which is a potato dish, and the snake company, which is a garlic and coconut and dutty based curry. But when the time came to read the recipe and cook, I just couldn't do it. Um, I volunteered to read the recipe and I managed to cook. It was a major disaster. But Amma said I was the best Amchi cook and run, of course couldn't stop laughing. 760 has a lot of memories of Amma. Every evening we would walk for 45 minutes and she would ask me questions about my growing up and my family. My mother and sister used to act in company plays directed by R.D. Kama. And though I was only five or six years old, I would memorize all the dialogues and so was the official doctor. I would enact certain scenes for Amma and sing the opening song. Saraswati Mahanadi Se Ami 
तुम ही दो ियन Uh, you learned Bharatnatyam from Guru Raghavan Nair, founder of Nritya Bodhi Institute. In your teens, uh, you followed your dream of acting and joined Aniket, an experimental theatre company in Bombay. Arundhati, you have been uh, merging theatres and dance for many years. You have been really experimenting with these things, and you have performed in off Broadway and off off Broadway theatre in New York. that's good that's really great to hear that both of you now live in goa where you conduct theater workshops using voice body imagination and space and you have worked for various organizations such as suna paranta i hope that's correct the architectural college gim serendipity arts festival at suko trust and goa open arts festival similarly i would like to introduce sunil chattopadhyay to the audience we know he's a pioneer of rock music in india 
and one of the first to start bands in Bombay. Tamla Devi bought him his first electric guitar from Japan, as you told us, and there was no looking back for Neil. Besides his music, Neil got involved in typesetting and advertisement outfits in New York. Returning to India, he works as a sound recordist in feature films and wildlife documentaries. It was so nice. And we can clearly see that your influence, uh, Amma's influence on you and your lives is so, so much. Now, uh, going over to, uh, thank you. Thank you for being with us, Arundhati. I'm sorry, uh, he had to step out. He had an emergency. So, okay, okay, thank you. We have to thank him yes. for being here. Although we'll have our uh, formal vote of thanks in the end, but uh, we are uh, so thankful he managed to, although I know he is shy and he didn't want to come, but we pulled him along. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. Now, as uh, we have arranged this program, uh, like one uh, personal talk and then professional, you know, what her public life was. And then again, we'll have Nina, you know, Nina after uh, my talk. Now, I will be talking about um, Srimati Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. As uh, you would know, I am member in charge library, Sheila, you just told us. Can you see? Yes, yes, we can. Is this want to increase the screen size? Yeah, is it fine now? Is it okay, Supriya? Can that, I see? Not yet. I have done technical glitches. Yeah. Actually, uh, you have to have a slideshow. Yeah, I have done it. You take a shift the slide little bit. Our face is covered. Okay. So then I go. Yeah. Now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now it's now is it's the, fine. Yes. Now it's fine. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Mrs. Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay as a social reformer and a freedom activist. Of course, this would also include her uh, activities uh, in the AWC and what all she did for AWC and in, uh, for the society and for social reform and uh, also for freedom struggle. Because we um, have to know that this was the time when women's issues were going together hand in hand with the freedom struggle. That's one thing that has emerged after this study. So she was basically a freedom fighter and a social reformer who strongly advocated that culture can play a significant role in the socio-economic development of the country and of the people. She was most remembered for her contribution to the independence movement, for the upliftment of the socio-economic standard of Indian women, by her pioneering work in the field of organizing women, and for being the driving force behind the renaissance of Indian handicrafts, handlooms, and theater in independent India. She even acted in films, as uh, Arundhati just told us, when at a time when acting was looked down upon. She combined the handicrafts making abilities of rural women for their social and economic development through cooperative movement at grassroots level and for her contribution in these fields, she was honored with one of the highest civilian awards, the Padma Vibhushan in 1987, the Padma Bhushan earlier in 1955, and in 1974, she was awarded the Sangeet Natak Academy Fellowship. And as we all know, she set up these institutions, which are flagship institutions even today, like the National School of Drama, the Central Cottage Industries Emporium, Crafts Council of India, the Children's Book Trust, the Dolls Museum, and many more. As Arunati told us that she was born in Bangalore uh, to a Chitrapur Saraswat Brahman family. So uh, in those days, and even today, I believe, Bangalore is a picturesque town on the western coast of the country 
She was the fourth and last child born to the liberal Saraswat Brahmin family of Girjabai and Anantaya Dhareshwar and was educated at St. Anne's Convent, Mangalore, Queen Mary's College, Madras, and Bedford College in London. And as is obvious uh, from her family background that uh, there were uh, many prominent freedom fighters and intellectuals, they used to come in and out of the house. Her childhood in the lush environments of the Western Ghats was one filled with local traditions, celebrations of festivals, with the ritualistic decorations, enjoyment of community puppet shows, storytelling, folk performances. Equally, her parents exposed her to intellectual, various intellectuals and freedom fighters like Gopal Krishna Gokhale, Srinivas Shastri, Rama Bairanade, Annie Besant, and many more. Her mother Girija Bai and I took this uh, Thank you, Anundati. I took this picture. There was no other picture of her anywhere on the net. So I took from yours. Her mother was a major, major influence on her. Although Kamla Devi faced many tra tragedies in the early childhood, uh, still she pulled along with the help of her grandmother and mother, who uh, even in those days, you know, when the when widowhood was challenged, you know, widowhood was not considered appropriate or you know, it was looked down upon, then still uh, they showed an independent living to women who greatly influenced her life. And uh, one of the reasons why Kamla Devi held on and is uh, like branched out into so many uh, areas setting up the Indian Cooperative Union and the Indian National Theatre. These institutions and these are the, the very first of their kind in the country. They show the influence of a very solid upbringing on her life. She was also a key figure in the internationalist uh, socialist feminist movement. From the late 1920s and 40s and beyond, she became an emissary for Indian women and political independence. She also advocated transnational causes such as racism and political and economic equity between nations and also attended the International Alliance of Women in Berlin in 1929. Uh, her major contribution in the field of women's reforms and also in the field of uh, lawmaking and legislation is not to be forgotten. Along with the uh, luminaries and activists who worked for All India Women's Conference, like Margaret Cousins, uh, Sarojini Naidu, Maharani of Barada, she campaigned for these reforms uh, in the country, going uh, to various, uh, uh, you know, politicians and advocating a reform to them. The the work of advocacy that she did is all there in her memoirs inner recesses, outer spaces. You can, uh, anyone can read. It's a lovely book and I think one of the uh, best books where one can find all the information of, about Kamala Devi. This was the time when the Government of India Act of 1919 had restricted women from becoming legislators. And the, the first, uh, you know, Government of India Act uh, was passed where uh, while Legislative assemblies was uh, were allowed. The women were not uh, supposed to be there, so they uh, went around advocating. And uh, uh, she was one of the persons, along with Margaret Cousins and others, who went to, even to Montague James for uh, to Man, uh, the Secretary of State in London and took a delegation asking for right to vote. And this was uh, one of the uh, first time that she, you know, came out into the public and was literally pulled along by Margaret Cousins. And that's a very interesting story, uh, which I'm going to tell you now. Uh, before we go over to that, uh, her activities in All India Women's Conference, there's one very interesting um, activity that she was, uh, she had undertaken at that time was in the field of education. Now, uh, now, she uh, was one of the first Indian women representatives 
to go to Geneva Conference of Educators in 1929. This was the time when All India Women's Conference had been founded, and uh, the uh, the uh, activity for setting up IWAFA, the All India Women's Education Fund, had started, and Lady Even College was to be you know set up. So. Uh, major action in the field of women's education was going on. And Mrs. Chattopadhyay was also selected to represent Indian Women's Association in the World Federation of Teachers in Geneva in 1929. And then after this, she went to another uh, conference in Denmark in August in the same you know, year. So, uh, and this, I, uh, there is this journal which used to come out and uh, just taken a screenshot. And they were very regular about, so this was a global phenomena that has come out and she was very actively involved into that. Uh, it's very, one very interesting thing that comes across. And um, she was, as we know, very instrumental in establishing the Lady Even College as the General Secretary of AIWC. And along with the others, you know, she traveled widely in the European countries, which inspired her to start social reform and community welfare programs. But as I said, globally, these things were happening, especially after the Second World War, after the First World War. Now, um, along with the Margaret Cousins, she was the co-founder of All India Women's Conference, and there were other ladies involved. In 1926, as I said, it was, uh, was a very interesting association. Uh, there was a lot of age difference between the two. With Kamla Devi was uh, literally, you know, guided through by Margaret Cousins, whom she used to call Greta. In 1926, uh, she met Margaret Cousins, the founder of All India Women's Conference, and who also inspired her to have her to have had run the in the previous. Uh, Provincial Legislative Assembly elections. Of course, she lost just by a margin of 55 votes. And uh, this was one of the first forays into a public life. And uh, then she became its uh, organizing secretary and treasurer. From I would like to quote from her memoir, Inner Recesses and Outer Spaces, how nervous she was while standing for elections and it was cousins who convinced her, I quote, it may not be correct to say that my public career really started seriously with my meeting Mrs. Margaret Cousins, Greta as we called her. Although there was considerable difference in our age, she never made me conscious of it. I quote her again, the first political move by Indian women was made when Greta organized a women's delegation in 1917 to Mr. Montaigne, British Secretary of State, to press for women's rights. Very, um, very clearly, she states that how Margaret Cousin was the guiding light throughout. Uh, as the Secretary of uh, All India Women's Conference during 1927 to 1930, she uh, did a lot of all, almost all welfare and social activities along with participating in the freedom struggle. You know, so this was the really multifaceted, multi-pronged activities that she was uh, going through at this time, and she took them up. They, uh, there were, uh, you know, very some very controversial things that, you know, like family planning, and you know, uh, advocating for breastfeeding that were taken up by her in 1930. And uh, she also vouched for women's sexual independence. To quote from her memoir, as a secretary, I had to travel a lot and had to keep in constant touch with branch members, unquote. Since there was not much help around, she carried her secretariat in her suitcase and whenever required would start working from anywhere, thus being completely self-sufficient. So she hardly believed in help from taking help from anyone. A very interesting picture that we have in our library is this, uh, the delegates, the big meeting of the 17th session of the All India Women Conference in 1944 held in Bombay. I quote from the annual report, because uh, as we remember in the previous year, we had seen how uh, in the previous uh, uh, lecture episode of the presidents, we had 
seen how uh, Shrimati Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was imprisoned and, you know, this was the period of the Quit India movement had just taken place and so many leaders and activists were imprisoned. So there, for almost two years, there was no conference that was held. The two years under review have been full of unexpected developments, both in India and abroad. And the conference had not escaped from the reactions of the political and economic upheavals. This, uh, she's referring to the Quit India movement and, and famine, with which India was hit very badly in the year 1943. In spite of this, the AIS WC branches continued to carry on many of their activities. Since the last session held in Kokanada in December 1941, the amended constitution has come into force, whereby all constituent branches now got an equal status. The standing committee met four times during this period under review all over the country at four places. And the annual session of the conference was not held in 1943 owing to the abnormal situation in the country. So the onus fell on this 17th session to you know, go ahead with all the tasks that had been piled up since then. The main features of the work undertaken, this is the picture of the standing committee. Again, it's not very clear, it's from our archives. You know, we could retrieve it only this much. And if you can see, I think Kamala Devi, this is the, you know, she's sitting here. And all the members of the standing committee are here. This is quite a spoiled photography. Somehow, I just could manage to retrieve it. So the main features of the work undertaken during the period under review were scheme for training of women for social service, agitation in support of the Hindu law committee, and relief work in connection with floods and famine in different parts of the country, of course, along with other activities. The scheme uh, for training of women for social service was drawn up as a consequence of the lack of trained women to carry on work in deep branches. So uh, I think this is the learning process through which AIWC had been going on. What is required, we do, you know, uh, so that has been our history. A training camp organized and run under the personal supervision of Srimati Kamla Devi was held in uh, 1942, uh, June. And it, this she was helped by the secretary, Srimati Mridula Sarabhai and Srimati uh, Meera Ben, the joint secretary. They helped in organizing the camps. Another activity was the professing and, you know, um, going, uh, going around advocating for the uniform civil code, for, about which Kamla Devi was very particular. AIWC at this time pushed for a demand to recognize women's work inside the house and on the field equal wage with equal opportunities. This was another aspect of the work. Under her leadership, the AIWC also vouched for the Uniform Civil Code to secure women's rights to property and children's guardianship. Some of these suggestions were overlooked and have resurfaced in contemporary political discussion. She also uh, was very particular about, you know, the male-female relationship. And she would say, you know, this, uh, this is a relationship of equality. And nobody can, you know, say uh, that uh, a woman is there to serve or she is subordinate. That's not true. To quote her, this is from her speech as the president, the women's movement is essentially a social movement and part of the process of enabling a constituent part of society to adjust itself to the constantly changing social and economic conditions and trying to influence the changes in conditions with a view to minimizing irritations and conflicts, making for the largest measure of harmony. Thus, it operates as an integral part of the progressive social structure in the broadest sense. And it's not a sex war, as uh, so many mechanically believe or are read, led to believe. What issue around which it revolves, such as the right of votes, inheritance, entry into professions and the like are an intrinsic part of the bigger issues, striving to overcome the prevailing undemocratic practices that deny common rights to certain sections of society. So she was very clear, clear about what the whole women's movement stood for. It was for association and harmony. And secondly, one a very clear thing that she was, which was very clear in her mind was that, uh, and I quote, the members of the conference 
may have different political affiliations, but I have no doubt they represent an effort to reach the same cherished goal of national freedom by varied paths. But to lose sight of that goal would mean the negation of the very objective this great organization stands for, self-respect and social solidarity. So these two things were very clear to her that the very goal of national freedom also implies in our personal lives. Uh, I mean, she didn't make any bones about her. Now we go over to her um, political life as a freedom fighter. What all were the influences and how as a young girl, beginning with a young girl, she went on to, you know, uh, in 1942, she uh, took up the, you know, uh, the flag and was a, took part in the freedom struggle. She was but 16 when she happened to be in Bombay and was taken to a mammoth meeting addressed by Mahatma Gandhi in Chopati. So Chopati was a sea of heads and they, she felt the power of Gandhi's appeal. She went on to take a pledge of Satyagraha and in 1920 volunteered for the Congress session in Belgaum. She was also then introduced to the Seva Dal in which her involvement gradually increased, although initially again she was hesitant here. So from her memoirs, we can very well make out how at every step you know, uh, her hesitation was overcome by her will to work and go on. In her memoirs, uh, she wrote about this, as you can read from the statement. Now, uh, participation in the freedom movement was one of, as I said, uh, one of the very major things that she was involved in and was to her liking. Uh, in 1923, when she was in London, she learned about Mahatma. When she was 16, she had heard him and was very impressed about her, his power. But then in 23, she was, you know, uh, pulled into this and she returned from London. She came to know of Mahatma Gandhi's non-cooperation movement and she promptly returned to India to join the Seva Dal, a Gandhian organization set up to promote social uplift. And soon she was placed in charge of the women's section of the Seva Dal where she got involved in recruiting, training, and organizing girls and women of all ages of women across India to become voluntary workers or sevikas. Then uh, from one step to another, she went on and on, and uh, there was no stopping her from the freedom struggle. Because uh, as she went along, she saw all the suffering. And initially, also, she was very much involved. She had seen. Uh, in the early phase of her you know, freedom struggle career that how she was very much involved or rather she saw how the revolutionaries worked so she was very much impressed and she got to know the inside out of the problems that indians were facing although she was a strong advocate of the soil satyagraha she deferred with gandhi's decision to exclude women in the march as we all know that there was a Gandhi march to break the soil law and in which Gandhi, for various reasons, mainly because he thought the British would think that we are you know, hiding behind women. So she said, oh, no, no, that's not what I, I don't agree with that idea. Uh, she was charged with violation of the soil laws and was sentenced to prison term. Uh, she captured the nation's attention when in a scuffle over the Congress flag, she clung to it tenaciously. At the same time, Kamla Devi was establishing political links outside India also. And during this march, she uh, came to the front and she organized women and, and was uh, her full, full potential as a freedom uh, fighter could be seen. And she was, of course, imprisoned. There she contracted jaundice. Having experienced the pathetic condition of the prison hospital, she built a hospital for inmates upon release. So this is how she reacted to problem so i think one of the best things one can if you have a problem how to solve it this is the best thing uh, at least i liked about um, when i read about her uh, she also then took on the problems of laborers and peasants and that uh, the socialist effect on her was quite clear at this time then i uh, we also just read about her uh, participation in the civil disobedience movement the sol satyagraha as we know and then um, she also kept on selling the illegal salt and got arrested and shared in prison. Uh, she was uh, imprisoned along with Sarojini Naidu in the Yerwada. 
women's prison. So uh, her persistence with this is another noticeable thing that uh, has not to be forgotten. Then uh, with her Gandhian ideas, her exposure to socialism uh, also was a big thing and shaped her ideas and career. According to her, imperial power was assisted by princes and capitalists, and therefore she adopted an anti zamindari anti-capitalist attitude. In 1936, uh, she became the president of the Congress Socialist Party and worked with Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and along with him, um, after that, he, she also contacted Jay Prakash Narayan, Ram Manohar Lohia, and Meenu Masani. And when the Second World War started, Kamla Devi was in England and she began, began a world tour to garner support for independence of India after the World War. So uh, after the Second World War, her activities in getting India freed increased. And this was also the time that she, in 1944, she became the president. So not only her influence increased, but also her activities in these various fields increased. And as we can see here, like uh, she was, uh, part of the very uh, important delegations that were being sent all over, like uh, the Shimla conference in 1945. The Indian independence was impending, you know, one could see it coming. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, partition talk going on. So one of the last plans was the Wavell plan, which of course failed, but some uh, very important luminaries, uh, pol politicians went in the delegation there and of course the talks failed with Jinnah and then it finally led to the partition of India. Uh, during World War II she visited America and met several political activists, mostly blacks, and shared with them in years non-violent approach to freedom struggle. The British got the wind of her activism and banned her from returning to India. Unmoved, Kamla Devi continued on her journey and visited South Africa, China, Japan, Vietnam. In America, uh, you know, as we talk about her multifarious activities and her dynamism and her multi pronged activities, she also had a small episode where she clashed with the police. In New York, it was okay. There was not much color consciousness that was obvious, but in the south of the country, it was a different story. And I'm reading out um, an excerpt from her memoirs. It was blatant and crude. It was soon after the train started moving through Louisiana that the ticket checking man addressed me very preemptorily. He said, you have to move out from here to the reserved section. I asked him politely why. That is the rule and you better obey it or you'll regret it. I explained this seat has been given to me when I got the ticket and I did not have any intention of moving from here. And then I went back to my book. She was reading a book and she very coolly just kept on reading it. To quote her again, I heard him give a snort and angrily stride away. He returned a little later in rather a subdued manner, a subdued air around him. Where do you come from? Was the next question. I said, New York. I mean, which land do you hail from? It makes no difference, I answered. I am a colored woman, obviously, and it is unnecessary for you to further disturb me, for I have no intention of moving from here. He muttered, you are an Asian, and went off. So this is, you know, uh, she could not, in this episode is, you know, uh, equated with that of Rosa Parks, you know, after her, soon after this, the, the uh, the black activist in America who led the bus boycott movement. If we remember some of us, that's another story, not, not here now, uh, that will take a lot of time. Uh, then um, uh, one of uh, her other important activity was in the field of uh, the post-independence activity rather could be seen in the uh, following the partition of India in the field of settlement of refugees. There was chaos mayhem and a huge influx of refugees and she set up the Indian Cooperative Union to help with the rehabilitation of refugees. There were um, some incidents that showed her independence as a woman and her compassion for the refugee women. You know, it was all there, how she literally felt strongly for them. She immediately asked the president, Rajin Prasad, 
that I need a land and I cannot see them, you know, being you know, just thrown around, melting in the soil. So her first task uh, was to rehabilitate them and uh, the piece of land was given to them. And uh, at length, Jawaharlal Nehru reluctantly gave her permission on the condition that she did not ask for state assistance. And so much after so much struggle, the township of Faridabad was set up on the outskirts of Delhi, rehabilitating over 50,000 refugees from the northwestern frontier of India, mostly Pathans, who are, you know, strong, burly. But when you look at them in a refugee camp, they were really in a pitiable condition. She worked tirelessly in helping the refugees to establish new homes and new professions. For this, they were trained in new skills. She also helped set up health facilities in the new town and thus began the second phase of her life's work in rehabilitation of people as well as their lost crafts. She is very um, remembered and is considered single-handedly responsible for the great revival of Indian handicrafts and handlooms after this, especially in the post-independence era. So one can learn from here how from a calamity like the partition she established a skill which helped them survive and sustain. Now, she always uh, was a, a craftsperson after that. And in fact, she said that now I am, uh, you know, to quote, she said, now I'm giving up politics. I left the highway of politics to step into the sideline of constructive work, field work with the artisans, the artists, those who create and produce, that mankind may live and grow, on not on bread alone but on things of beauty which uplift and raise us above the petty things of everyday life that was her you know motto and that's what drove her along a flagship project was the india international center where you would have a the multi-purpose hall uh, named after kamla devi Chattopadhyay, the kamla devi hall block and these uh, foundations were laid under her stewardship and she uh, uh, inaugurated it along with other luminaries as you can see from this picture here and they uh, president uh, the mr c d deshmukh who was the president of the trust and one of the trustees was kamla devi so all these people they gathered near her and she was the driving force right from looking uh, choosing the place where it should be all that she could, and inaugurating with the Japanese luminaries, as you can see, the Japanese princes and prince. From here, henceforth, there was no looking back. All art, craft related activity for which we are going to have another lecture soon. So I'm not going to linger on this much. San Sangeet Natak Academy and was, you know, and kept under her. She was the chairperson. Uh, she got the UNESCO award in 1997, uh, uh, given here by Moraji Desai. Crafts Museum was set up by her. There's going to be another lecture on this, so I'm not just. World Crafts Council was set up, and then she set up the Indian the Crafts Council of India. So, uh, as I said, since the beginning, she connected the global with the national. That is one thing. This is the motto. She said, those who serve the council must accept their role as facilitators, not patrons of the artisans. Humility is therefore as important as sensitivity if CCI is to generate the national movement for which it is founded. Several uh -huh. awards, the whole list of awards and accolades uh -huh. never ending. She got the Padmini Bhushan, the Padmini Bhushan, the Raymond Maxisil Award for Community Leadership, the Sangeet Natak Academy Fellowship, and the UNESCO Award, and the Shanti Niketan University Honor. Of course, she was a book person. She was a prolific writer. And I have a book with her uh, autograph. This is for the audience to enjoy, you know, at the crossroads. This book was written in the 1960s and has several topics, very different, uh, different know, topics, like from the freedom struggle mm -hmm. to her foreign forays. Thank you so much for listening to me and for this opportunity. I would like to thank the president, uh, Sheila Kakadeji, secretary, Kulji, very nice. uh, treasurer, uh, Srimati Khanaji, 
and of course our library i don't have to forget ranjana and uh, uh, you know sujata from the library have been you know the backbone of this and uh, i cannot help them you know. thank you so much for patient here very nice very nice good presentation you take up thank you now we go over to our next presentation uh, by nina nina uh, i'm I here hope, yeah, yeah. Good to can see you hear me yeah loud and clear yeah. ah, so here i am uh, nina chattopadhyay menon worked in seattle for 25 years as a therapeutic child care worker she specialized in teenage mothers and children at risk for abuse and neglect retiring from that she and her husband ram menon opened a bead shop come workshop in seattle washington this was primarily to encourage young entrepreneurs to use gemstones and silver from india and another connection with india to quote nina amma played a large part in my love for indian crafts so i am sure you are going to give us an insight into her crafts and her personal life it's going to be very interesting over to you nina okay thank you very much my primary goal here is to uh, portray amma as uh, the person, the grandmother, the great grandmother, and uh, what she meant to us as we were growing up. Um, uh, I'm not going to go back into all of her her uh, uh, what what she has achieved because we know all of that. And I actually tried to humanize her a little bit on her Wikipedia page, but someone decided to uh, dry it up again. <laughs> So that was that. Um, she was a warm and loving grandmother and a great grandmother, and her hugs were soft and precious. Um, she, her saris were always exotic, and there was always the lingering smell of jasmine and sandalwood uh, when we hugged her and sat close to her. Um, she inspired women and artists around her, myself included. Both of uh, my, uh, my, my mother as well. Both of us have had a deep love for Indian crafts, both fine and folk in our uh, collection in my house, which is a museum. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, yeah. Has my face gone away? No, it's there. Oh, it's perfect. It's there. It's it's, it's, it's okay, okay. Great, great. And our collection has often been called, I mean, people walk into my house and go, oh my gosh, it's a museum. So the collection is here. Um, I wanted to say that um, Amma had a psychological, uh, jail had an, a big psychological impact on Amma. We talk about it and it disappears in two minutes. Uh, she rarely talked about it. But for many years, she ate off a battered aluminum plate, aluminum plate until my mother replaced it with Jaipur pottery. She felt that that was somehow a testament to what she had suffered in jail. And she, although she never talked much about any of these things, she loved something called milk toast. And the British would give them a glass of milk and a piece of bread, and she would heat it over a candle. And that would be a treat for her in, in her prison cell. So that is, that is something that um, really hit home to me. Um, and my, my school friend's grandmother uh, told me another story, which she never told me, was that the British did not allow them to have um, kadar blouses for their saris. So Amma demanded khadar blouses, and uh, when they didn't give them to her, she just took hers off and covered herself with the pallu of her sari and threw it out of her cell, and all the other women followed suit. So knowing the British at that time, you know that they got their khadar blouses pretty quickly after that. So, um, so... Abma encouraged every spark of interest in, um, in, in people around her. She recognized and appreciated commitment, and she expected hard work of everybody. Um, 
she had Miss Mohana Iyengar, who uh, was, was her help and traveled with her a lot. And then there was Jocelyn Damija, who we met when she was still in school, uh, still in college, I mean. And these, are, we called her gasoline auntie. But um, they, were, they were frequent visitors to our house. They were young and vibrant, and they played with us a lot um, uh, until Ahmad demanded their attention. And then, of course, they had to get to work. And we were about eight or ten years old, so that's, that's as far as my memory is for that. Um, Justine doesn't need any introduction. She's a well-known champion of Indian crafts, prolific author, and a textile historian. Uh, she was a playmate telling us silly jokes and admiring our artwork. Miss uh, Mohana was also a beloved visitor. She worked and traveled extensively with Amma to remote places. Um, she also worked with Amma at the Class Council of India. Mother often joined them. My mother really enjoyed these trips into the interior and um, enjoyed uh, uh, meeting craftspeople. And uh, a, a funny story is once they endured a stay in a small dark bungalow in Bastar. And Bastar uh, in the 60s was an extremely wild place. And Amma had the only bed. Mom and Mohana were given mattresses on the floor. And uh, they ended up sleeping on the large dining table because enormous rats roamed all over them all night. So that's another story of, of traveling with Amma. Amma took us traveling too. We visited many craft centers in the north and south, weaving, carving, toy making, like especially in Chanapatna, uh, embroidery, embroidery in Kashmir, and um, uh, we loved Kashmir. Um, we got to see snow there for the very first time. So, uh, and strong in my mind is the fact that a Pashmina shawl actually passed through the ring that I passed, I gave the salesman. And I, it, it, I can still remember that it was the softest fabric in the world and Amma was totally smitten by it. Uh, in Punjab, we went to a small village cooperative where the headman declared that he had perfected the taste of Coca-Cola. And what I'm presuming is that Coca-Cola had been banned at that point in India. So Amma sat Neil and me down. Neil and I had to sit down and taste this Coca-Cola. Because um, uh, she didn't feel qualified. She said, I don't drink Coca-Cola. I don't feel qualified to, to taste this. So um, I think we were very polite about the taste of it. And we didn't make any mention of it until we got back in the car. Um, let's see, we witnessed a dust storm in Rajasthan, driving through Rajasthan, locusts in Delhi, uh, at her Canning Lane home where the Mali sat with his head in his hand because the locusts had destroyed his enormous garden, his enormous beautiful garden. Um, once I came home to Bombay, in Bombay, with a 10 rupee print of a Madhubani painting. Even at that age, I must have been 16 or 17, I was absolutely furious that someone had printed a Madhubani painting. And if I was angry, Amma was furious. She got on the phone and she was on the phone for the rest of the day. And I will tell you that uh, there, uh, original artworks by tribal artists are, there's a law that says that they cannot be printed and sold as prints. So um, I'm glad that the, the artists uh, from all over the country, the Gons, the, the Madhubani, all of that are getting their just due at this point. Um, Amma always bought firecrackers for Diwali. She was the firecracker lady. Um, our family would gather, Amma's nephews and their kids came from Matunga. And we uh, went up on the roof of our apartment building and sweets were supplied by a local friend of hers who was a Mithaiwala. And Uncle Malia, Uncle Amma's companion, who was a patron of Indian arts and crafts and member of parliament, and the inspiration behind the Malia Memorial Theatre, Crafts Museum in Delhi, had a flat at Breach Candy. Uh, that's where we had the fireworks. 
We loved going to Dil Pazir. Amma, Malia uncle, and Sithama would be there. Sithama was my, my grandfather's second wife. And when he left her, Amma took her under her wing and took care of her for the rest of her life, which is something I think that is remarkable for, uh, I mean, the ultimate in f feminism. Um, Sita Mao became a part of the family. She was always there. She babysat us. Uh, she was wonderful. She was like a second grandmother. Um, Mali uncle and, si and uh, Amma would be working frantically on their papers and whatever they were doing. Uh, but they didn't mind us running around the house. And one day we played hide and seek. And uh, we, uh, 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 Mali uncle had this wonderful idea of being stuck into an old Chinese chest. And we put him in the Chinese chest and closed the door at the, the top. And Amma was, Amma's job was to find him and she couldn't find him anywhere. And then suddenly we heard this heavy knocking and he was trying to get out and he couldn't get out. So Amma realized that this was a dangerous situation. He could probably suffocate in there. So we called the cook from the kitchen and with a huge kitchen knife, he pried the chest open. Poor Amma, poor Mali uncle, he got a big earful from Amma and we both hugged him in sympathy. Despite her sometimes serious demeanor, which made men and women alike quake with fear, uh, she always spoke her mind. There was never a time where she uh, held back. If she felt something was wrong, she, she spoke. And anyone who's close to her will tell you that. She had an excellent sense of humor. I can remember Neil as a child doing something funny and she would laugh until tears came up. Came. Um, Amma made a lot of effort to advance our interest in Hindustani and Carnatic music. Um, you know, for, for kids that's sometimes boring, but we did it. And we entered, we attended many concerts. Alara Ka, Bismillah Khan, Ravi Shankar, Shiv Kumar Sharma, and of course, lots more. She also enjoyed rock music. And you'll see a picture of uh, George Harrison there. Um, Beatles, Rolling Stones, James Taylor. She would come out quietly from her room and she would say, could you please raise the volume? I can't hear these songs in my room. And my mother would be shocked because my mother would be telling us, turn it down, turn it down, you're bothering her. So um, she, much to our envy actually, she stayed at the home of an artist in London who was painting, as you can see in this picture, painting a portrait of, uh, of uh, Paddy Boyd and uh, George Harrison. <coughs> they met Amma and uh, they really enjoyed her company. And years later, I had, a, I had the chance to speak to Paddy Boyd, who was long divorced from George Harrison. And she said, oh, I remember Mrs. Chatter. Oh, we called her the grand old lady. She said she was, she was absolutely uh, uh, entertaining, lovely, and a gracious woman. So that's that was that. Now, interesting visitors. Our home in Mumbai was always busy when she was there. We had distinctive, distinguished visitors. Queen Hope of Sikkim, the entire Bedi family, Vijanti Mala, Beatrice Wood, who was a potter, and uh, Mrs. Jahavala, mother-in-law of Ruth, Robert Jabvala, I believe she was a freedom fighter and uh, also uh, in jail at the same time as Amma. She was a wonderful person, affectionate and funny. Uh, Neil and I visited His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharmshala. I had met him when I was four years old um, and I was apparently a real brat. So when he called me, he must have been quite young then, called me and put me on his lap. Apparently, I calmed down and let them continue their meeting without a problem. Um, we, heard, uh, we heard terrible, tragic stories of escape from the Chinese soldiers uh, uh, at that time, in Dharamshala, sorry. And uh, I, I was about 16, and he said, my, you have grown. And uh, we laughed. Um, and he was pleased that I liked the Tibetan sweets and said he was inviting me to the Potala 
and my brother, of course, and I could have as many sweets as I want. Sadly, he never did get his putala back. Um, I'm going to end with a somewhat humorous story of Amma's commitment to crafts. I had found two Bombays, which you will see here, um, in a small, um, a, a small uh, craft shop in Bangalore. I spent my last hundred rupees on it, on them. Came home. This was uh, sometime in the eighties. Came home, and she was absolutely, absolutely over the moon because they were new. They were absolutely beautiful, and she asked if I could find out who did them, and I said I don't know, and you know all of that. So the next morning, I woke up to a curious sight. She was packing to go back to Delhi. Uh, she had one doll under each arm and was heading steadily to her room. And I asked what she was doing, and she gave me a sheepish smile. She said, you know, these, these really belong in the museum. And I said, Amma, but I won't be able to enjoy them. Oh, she sighed, and she handed them back to me. And then she gave me a charming smile, typical of her, and a little giggle. And she said, well, it was worth a try. So I just wanted to humanize Amma in this particular uh, in this particular forum because she was she was a real person and uh, she had a real family and we enjoyed her and I miss her terribly we all miss her terribly so thank you for allowing me to talk and and, and share some stories and thank, thank you. you so much for everybody else who's been made this uh, stressless <laughs> a stressless uh, uh, forum and a stressless uh, uh, meeting. You were amazing. You were amazing. Thank you, the thank family. You. Thank, thank you, thank family. you. Thank you. Thank you for humanizing Amma. I mean, um, <laughs> she Lord. was a human. She yeah. had all, she was a good human, yes. Such sweet memories, both of you. Very yeah. sweet, wonderful memories. Yeah. Actually, just, her last words to me in 1987 were, you know, Nina, I thought you'd be a weaver. All I wanted in my life was to be a weaver. And I said, oh, Ma, you've done so many things. You've written so many books. And she said, you know, this is the last time I'm going to see you, which it turned out to be. And she said, I just wish you had been a weaver. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm a social worker. You started as a social worker. And she said, uh, yeah, that's true. And she gave me a big hug, and uncharacteristically, she cried as I left. So she never cried. So anyway, that's, so, that's that. Such a sweet narration. I, I think it's not never enough listening to both of you and the, the small tidbits, travel, the childish pranks. We got carried away, you know. I we didn't know this thing about Kamla Reviji, but now that you, we can imagine, you know, her in that. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was You're amazing. Welcome. You're very welcome. So now we Thanks proceed uh, over to our next talk by Mrs. Kripa Shetty. Uh, she is the standing committee member of AIWC Mangalore branch. She's going to talk about uh, her remembrances uh, of Srimati Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay in Mangalore. Kripa ji, uh, you can share. We cannot hear you. Yeah, we can see the PPT. Do you see it? Yeah, perfect. Kripaji? Yeah. Uh, you are unmute, but we cannot hear you. I mean, you have to connect something to. No, we cannot hear you. Can you retry? I mean, mute and unmute again. You can try yeah, something. Oh. Yeah, some help would do. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Yes, hello, yes, hello. Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. 
yes last yes, weekend perfect yes. mm -hmm. yeah can you display my videos ma'am this is uh -huh. yeah this you can can you can you see it on the top of the eye can you see the screen there are her photos can you slip it up yeah yeah you can Shall start to the next one yeah you begin your I, can, I will talk to her detail then you can show the videos or will you show the videos first Kripa ji, uh, you have, you have Kripa ji, you have fifteen minutes, right? Thank you. Please, yeah. all yours, fifteen minutes. Ah, yeah. uh, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay was was born. It's written something that I can't hear, see it properly. Legend from Karnataka, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. Yeah. Extraordinary woman, extraordinary life. Yeah. Next, ma'am. Next, you can see her photos. It was young. This is when she was young, and now uh, the old age, uh, the old age times. Yeah, young and old. Yeah. This is Annie Besant, who came to Mangalore for her inauguration of uh, Besant School. Besant. Yeah, yeah. Foundation stone. She laid for the Besant High School first. All right. Yeah. Which was founded by Kam Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and her Saraswat community people, but we, she called Annie Besant, who was living in Adyar that time, to inaugurate the Annie, uh, school, Besant school there. And these are the institution. Later, it became a very big institution, ma'am, having Besant Evening College. You just move it, ma'am. You will know how many institutions are there now. This is the first school where it was inaugurated, and the Besant Evening College. And it's called the colleges. This is high school, first high school. Evening, present evening college is this. Uh, next, next map. Uh, present evening library and information center. Everything. This was a, this was a, a school hostel for the children before. Pre-university college. Ah, this is a Theosophical Society in Mangalore, ma'am, which was first founded by Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and her Saraswat Bhamini community. To inaugurate it, she called Annie Besant, who was living in Adya at that time. She came to inaugurate this Theosophical Society that time. Next one, ma'am. I mean, this, this is the same thing. photo of that. It is, it is on the road, on the right side of the road. It is, it's a very quite a big, uh, big compound it is, very big one. This is next one, the Balika Ashtam, yeah. which was founded by Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya, and it was donated, that term was donated by Ramarao, a social worker, because in his mother's name that time. It, that's why it was written Balika Sevashtam. And it was later shifted to Bhagini Samaj. It was founded there by them, but it was see Shishu Vihar Foundation. Foundation stone. That time it was laid by some Raja Ratnam, be a collector of South Kendra man, by that fellow. It was founded, Bhagini Samaj founded by Ch Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and her Saraswat family members. I, I will go through it, ma'am. You just see. I think other basic institutions were there. I think it's not there. I, Kripa Shetty, standing committee member of Bhagini Samaj, Manglo is honored and humbled today to speak about the great lady of the century, Kamala, Bhai, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya. She is a role model to each and every woman of our nation. If not mistaken, every nation of this world. No woman can achieve so much in one's lifespan. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay was born on 3rd April 1903 at Bindur Kundapur. She was the fourth and younger daughter of her parents. Her father, Anantaya Dareshwar, was a deputy collector. Her mother, Girija Bhai, was from a Saraswat Brahmin family from coastal Karnataka. Kamala Devi's mother was well educated and well versed in music and craft. Her father, Anantaya Dareshwar, was transferred from Kundapur and his family came to Mangalore. They were living in a tiled house in Kodial Bail. They were related to Ekambar Rao, who was the headmaster of Ganapati High School. 
His wife Leela Bai was the cousin of Srimati Girija Bai. The Saraswat family of Manglo were all working and interested in theosophy. At that time, they were interested in building a convention hall for the Theosophical Society. For that, they invited Mrs. Annie Besant, who was the Theosophical Society in Adyar, Adyar Madras. Annie Besant came for the inauguration ceremony of Theosophical Society building in Shady Guda, Manglo. At that time, Girijabai and Saraswat Samaj of Manglo thought of establishing a primary school for the children of of the poor and middle class. So Girija Bhai brought a hillock next to the rented house in which Kamala Devi's parents lived. So they invited Mrs. Annie Bezen to lay the foundation stone of the primary building. And the present Bezen College institutions were named after Annie Bezen. Kamala Devi's mother Girija Bhai and Saraswat family founded Maila Sabha in the heart of the city. It is more than 100 years old. It is there, ma'am. I have showed it in the clip. It is there. Okay. Maila Sabha. Yeah, yeah you please, so please read it out. There. Yeah, you can read yeah. it out. Yeah, I will read it. It is a platform for the ladies of Mangalore to express their views and problems and skills. It is still thriving and ladies of Mangalore use this platform to the best of gender ability. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya completed a primary education in St. Thomas, a Christian. That also is there, ma'am, there. I have written it there. It is dear. Yeah, it yeah, is sure. in that snaps, the photos. Yeah. You can see it. Clearly, I can mention it. It is in St. Thomas, a Christian institution in Mangalore. And for higher studies, she went to Madras, Chennai, and later to Delhi. The Saraswat community of Mangalore joined with Girija Bhai and a Cousin Leela by Ekamba Rao to start a home for the poor and the socially distributed widowed women and girls. It is called the Ishwaranda Mahila Samaj. That's very good day in Mangalore. Now it has grown up to well developed institution, filtering about 300 students and working women in Bandur Kankanadi, having its own building. In the house in which Kamala Devi's parents live, was first a daycare center for the poor poor children of working women during Second World War, where the women brought their children and left them in daycare center till evening. At that time, a component building was donated by the deputy collector, Mr. Raja Ram, to open an orphanage in his mother's name in Jappu. So, the daycare center was to the building in Jappu. The building was named by Kamala Devi Chattopadhyayas and family members as Bhagani Samad. It was the time of Satyagraha when Gandhiji visited Mangalore. Kamala Dayu intensely, intensely interested in Satyagraha movement. By then, her family had shifted from Kodial Bank to Shady Gudda to a comfortable modern house. And now it has been the office of the BD company. Everything is there, ma'am. The snaps have taken and displayed it. You can see in this. We showed all this. By then, Kamala we showed Dayu all this snaps first. Arindranath Chattopadhyay, who was then employed as English lecturer, Saint Eloysius College in Mangalore. Ma'am, it is also there, ma'am. Arindranath Chattopadhyay was the first English lecturer in Saint Anne's College in Mangalore. With her poet and playwright husband Kamala Devi, travelled across India and performed theatre. She also had a touch in Indian cinema too. I think it has told before by some of one of members yes, here. Yeah. I have no need to explain it. But at last, but not at least, the famous writer named Yusuf Morley, a fellow freedom fighter, named her in the most as the most interpreted woman of India, and he could unhesitating, unhesitatingly point it towards Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya in his book called Leaders of India in 1942. I really bow down my head to this great lady. Thank you, ma'am. The Thank photos you. were all displayed, Thank you. Thank you. displayed it very fastly, so you are not able to see it. Yeah, Thank you, ma'am. I finished my For the very meticulously assembled information about uh, Mangalore on Kamla, Devi yeah. Chattopadhyay, you didn't know so many of these places. I hope said. it is clear, ma'am. I don't have it. It, it was, was clear for you all. That's, that's amazing is, to is know. Is it clear, ma'am, for the youth? Yeah, yeah. It was perfect. I yeah, I it, it was very I nice. a lot of things. Very yeah. good, Kripa. Yeah. So many things we didn't know, and you brought us 
you you brought the awareness in us. So that's a great uh, thank, thank you to you. Thank you, ma'am. Maybe some of these so lockdown, ma'am. All the weekend is locked up. But still, I try yeah. my best to collect the photos, go there, take the, uh, take the talk to Which the principals, the take the snaps. Yeah. They won't leave us to take the snaps like that. I but I extend them. I have to give it to show it to AWC. You, told you have me. to leave me. Then they then sir supported I, me. I have got a very good treatment with them. Very good, very good job. Thank you so much. Well done. Well done, Kalyan. Now we Thank go a lot, man next speaker for today and for everyone's information there's a small clip a video clip about uh, on uh, i mean uh, yeah you can see video. that video clip uh, i'm going to you show. can see with kamala devi chatrapad as a primary school her yeah. education where she spent everything her husband where he was the first english lecturer in saint elusis college yeah. everything i have taken ma'am you can see this clip now we move the videos yeah, a speaker, we don't have much time now. Uh, okay, okay, after, thank you, ma'am. Thanks uh, a lot. After that, uh, we would like to show a small video clip on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, where we have bits uh, spoken by her. So we will be able to see her. So I would request everyone to stay put. And uh, first, we'd like to invite uh, Professor Jyotsna Tiwari. She is Professor of Department of Education in Arts and Aesthetics in NCRT. Uh, you are there, madam? Yes. Yeah, yes. She, yeah. She's been here. Uh, she, uh, she has a long experience of development of curriculum, syllabus, textbooks, supplementary books, teachers' handbooks, modules and packages, and uh, learning indicators and outcomes, and uh, a, lo a long list of audio-visual programs and multimedia CDs in this field of uh, art and aesthetics. And I'm sure you are the right person to be talking about Srimati uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay's uh, achievements post-independence, all her craft forays and activities. You have been involved in training and organizing as resource person for various in-service and pre-service teachers education programs, teacher educators training, orientation and refresher courses at NCRT, RIE, SCRT, DIET, KBs, NBs, CTS and DAV schools, face to face and now more recently online modes. You have been uh, going into various seminars and conferences and chairing sessions on these uh, uh, arts and aesthetics related curriculum related programs and have been evaluating and screening projects and proposals. You have a long list of academic and administrative activities and NCRT. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it, it, it's okay. So one who is in NCRT has to undergo, whether it's a punishment or a it's good thing. It's all part of our job. But yeah. so, so I invite you now to speak on uh, Kamla Devi's uh, activities post-independence in the field of craft, art and craft. Um, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, really, I'm thankful to AIWC to give me this opportunity. Uh, before uh, being a faculty of NCERT and all, I have a very, uh, you know, kind of a very emotional bonding with uh, uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyayji as well as Popul Jaikar and others, other women who took this uh, whole, you know, uh, project of uh, handicrafts and handlooms and promoted it. And like uh, this is one of uh, the soft powers of our country, which is there and for which we are known. And she had a great contribution in bringing it to the national and international forum. But I'll just uh, because uh, I have uh, I had my specialization because I am an art historian. I had my specialization in uh, Indian arts and crafts uh, mainly, and I've done a lot of documentation around. So that is why I had always read about Kamla Devi's, uh, you know, writings and her work. And uh, my contribution towards her was that when we introduced in 2008, we introduced a course of heritage craft uh, in NCRT and we uh, developed some textbooks and the syllabus and all. And this is where she is like. Uh, in a box, we have given a brief this thing along with all our contributions and things. Uh, this was a special dedicated box on Kamla Devi Ji's as well as another on Pupul Jaikar. Uh, 
I mean, I'll just go back. A lot of uh, her, about her has been said, and I don't want to repeat. Like everybody knows that she, her contribution. Uh, if we look at that time when she was there, I mean, it was something which was, uh, you know, there were very few women in India who were so active, and her multifaceted personality actually is a example. How she, Sarojini Naidu, and all the other Indi Besant, and all these people. What was the challenges before uh, them? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Yuthika said that she left uh, politics at some point of time after uh, in the 50s, and dedicated all her life through creating uh, Crafts Council of India and its you know different chapters in every state and made that presence but i'll just go back 100 years before that what had happened during the colonial period during the british period that a very rich part of our heritage in the uh, form of handloom and all these things had been uh, you know it had met a, a natural death kind of a thing because of so many factors which we all know in the history but we always had this uh, there because, um, I mean, whatever is traditional, whatever is there, it's a huge knowledge system, Indian knowledge system, which had always existed uh, during all these periods and which was which went to, a, you know, in the background and it was pushed. Gandhiji's uh, call for Swadeshi and all these things and Hatkarga and, you know, uh, Khadi, all these things came as a, um, you know, boon in disguise. Then, uh, I mean, he was into weaving and all these things, self-sufficiency and all. Kamla Devi took it further and, you know, made it more colorful, I would say, more, uh, you know, sustainable and brought all these craftsmen at the platform. And we all know, uh, I mean, it's uh, history, like how we have all these emporia which were established. She, uh, she was an institution builder, basically. I mean, the Crafts Museum in Delhi, which uh, is uh, a sort of living example of all the Indian crafts and which is so rich. The whole vision, how things have to be taken was her vision. And now, I mean, we have separate ministries and so many institutions which came up uh, because uh, uh, and something which was more this thing that these are all government organizations. These are not non-profitable organizations or voluntary organizations or anything, but she institutionalized all these, you know, initiative of hers. And that is why they could sustain also thrive uh, during these uh, all these years. So handicrafts and handloom export corporation, handloom. Uh, I mean, it became a household name, handloom industry, handicrafts, and which was uh, like otherwise uh, we had uh, been knowing before independence that only khadi was like may, being made popular to make the sustainable, but it all. Uh, you know, spread like uh, anything and throughout not even a state, not even a region was left where she did not intervene, you know. I mean, through state council, crafts council uh, uh, organizations and yeah, though she had in, been involved with some voluntary organizations, but mainly these were all like self-help groups or they were patronized by the government. So that was something which was remarkable and her efforts that Central Cottage Industries Emporium. I mean, we all love to go there, see the crafts, but this is all the result of her, you know, hard work that we can see so much of variety, so much of diversity of Indian handicraft, handloom industry. So we all are in debt to her. Whether it's northeast, whether it was down south, uh, she never discriminated. Like it was, uh, the you know things came uh, even in crafts museum. All the parts of India were represented, and then um, we know how festival of India took place in 1982, and then all that. 
wherever like she could take indian uh, handloom indian handicraft she took it and the that is why we see whatever the richness which is the you know post independent independence uh, intervention i mean now things are uh, more uh, this thing but the foundation that okay like the uniqueness of kanji varam sarees or uniqueness of banarsi brocade and all these things were popularized all as well like otherwise people were i mean they were making it but then and the whole concept of exporting and things like that so became export promotion council of india this that and they all so i mean uh, i don't want to take much of your time because if we keep on going into it uh, like it's a huge uh, yeah. and uh, another thing is that she it, it was not for promotion of these uh, you know uh, local industries handicraft industries uh, called for lot of other interventions in the uh, form of uh, designs the material uh, the cross uh, sections among different types of uh, so all this whole concept that they started learning from each other and then the you know availability of even the local material and all those things how it became a sort of a self sufficient industry and uh, i mean then there is no looking back i think I, we all know what is there in front of us and we uh, why we wanted to introduce just to take this forward that our children also at some stage so this was a course at the plus 2 level in the senior secondary and uh, we were we wanted uh, them the our students to though uh, it's already there in different uh, subjects woven into the syllabus and all but uh, even uh, in uh, this uh, exclusive course we introduced where we uh, have uh, i mean you know spread over two years how they can do the documentation of crafts how they can you know do the conservation part of crafts our heritage and all those things because of that we uh, had a series of uh, three books which was uh, on the uh, craft traditions of india naming craft traditions of india and uh, where we wanted not only to sensitize our younger generation because we found that many of them they use these things but they don't know what is the story behind all this like what is the material uh from where it comes so we had some six parameter the uh, local resource management because this was all inbuilt and this is what she promoted that the local material has to be used it will not be like everything will not be imported so if bamboo is a particular or a particular silk is found at some place like how we can uh promote that through that so that concept only we wanted to bring among our children so that they can work in this uh, sector contribute to the you know uh, this so all these were my uh, i mean that is all i <laughs> i mean not <laughs> because you can keep uh, go keep on <laughs> you know saying keep on going okay, uh, thank you so that much. but ha uh, huh. Uh, with that yeah. i liked your uh, uh, organizing this event i am really thankful uh, to listen to you all uh, though in between there was some there is some meeting which is going on we are celebrating our 60th uh, i mean 60 years uh, our institution is completing on the first so we have to organize with all the limitations and all that we have to organize a gala show <laughs> so we were into that uh, sitting since morning so uh, really thank, thank you. you thank you so much jyotsna ji uh, for taking time out from your i can see you are still in the office yeah, yeah. thank you so much and uh, we are grateful for giving us insight into uh, what she did and why she did that reminds me about the colors you know when she was in the seva dal they had those dark uh, blue uh, sarees and dresses and she said by itself it's fine but when you gather together it's all dark and she disliked she detested that maybe the family remembered that uh, they might uh, recollect something like that but uh, she was basically she liked colors you know that's what one can gather and the the aesthetics part which you just said and i hope the future generation keeps it intact and inculcates it and 
you know, further relays it forward for me. We, we need to sustain this uh, inheritance that we have from Kamla Deviji. Uh, now, we uh, before I open the forum for the audience, I would like to show a short clip if everyone is game, uh, because this is really interesting. And if we go... Ji, can I leave? Because in the next room, okay. we are okay. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Jyotsadi. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank, thank you Lord for being with us. Yeah. We'll give a formal vote. Thank but... you. Thank you, Jyotsna Ji. Thank you. OK, so uh, I hope everyone can see that. Is that clear? Yeah. Turn it around to me. With them was a Sanskrit scholar. Young Tamza was drawn by the sonority of the Sanskrit language. Of course, I was too young to be able to abuse it. But I used to be quite excited. I stopped with with others and carry on discussions. Can you turn it? See if yours is louder. I also was very fond of books and reading, and we had a large collection of books. So I suppose I grew up. Books and Kamla's father died when she was still very young. She continued her studies with encouragement from her mother. She was very conscious of the disabilities of women, economic, legal, and social. She wanted changes she wanted more freedom for women she used to go around and uh, read to women because it was not very easy in those days to collect women together but later she started a women's association in her own house uh, which of course later on grew up to be a big organization and the up-and-coming poet actor for Harin, it was love at first sight, and so felt the call of home. Back in India, the couple began to develop their plans for a theatre movement and toured the country to present their productions. Kamala's interest in acting led her to films and encouraged other women to take to the performing arts. However, as the freedom struggle gathered momentum, Kamla Devi was drawn into the center of it. Under Gandhiji's influence, she learned to spin and weave. She was fascinated by India's traditional arts and crafts. Another major influence was that of Margaret Cousins, a family friend. Margaret Cousins actually was much more than a friend. Let me say she was my guru, under whom I learned to do public work. She was the one who encouraged and gave me the guidelines and persuaded me also to take up the secretaryship of the All India Women's Conference when it was first established. She guided and helped me. She laid down what you might call the norms or the guidelines for public activities, uh, which were of great help. But actually, my first uh, association with political uh, activity began with the volunteer movement. I enlisted as a volunteer just before the Bengal.
नो साउंड युतिका जी म्यूटेड म्यूटेड युतिका युतिका यो म्यूटेड युतिका अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ Unmute, Yutika. Y Yutika, you're yeah. muted. Yeah, yeah. I did that now. Just now. Let me resume here. Yeah. And I was, uh, I watched <coughs> the Chopati sands. We treated the most of my people than even the sand. But I was just amazed how literally thousands of people were breaking the salt law. By making salt. On the 17th of May, Amla Devi was arrested and sentenced to nine months imprisonment at Yeravadi Jail. On her release, she took charge of the women's wing of the Seva Dhan to train the Satyagrahis. Seva Dhan was banned and Amla Devi arrested and sent to Arthur Road Prison. Another period of imprisonment in Villar Jail followed. It was solitary confinement for almost a year. They could uh, let me stay out of the cell at night because it was unbearably hot, but they refused, and so I'm getting locked up every night. When she came out of prison, the Socialist Party was being formed. She was one of its founder members. The contribution mm -hmm. that the Socialist Party made was to give a stronger social and economic bias. We may say that these were also the principles that Gandhi stood for. The country seized with revolutionary fervor. Mm -hmm. Movement because it was a freedom movement had attracted me, and uh, I felt it was a uh, right and duty of mine to do my bit, contribute what I could towards the freedom struggle. And the fact that at the end of it, I had uh, fulfilled the pledge I had taken that I would work for the freedom of the country. But after that, uh, I thought I couldn't take on politics as a career because that wasn't my vocation, it wasn't my medium of expression. The other things which I felt were uh, much more uh, reasonable and vital to my way. The country had been partitioned into two, nearly five. In the course of her work with the refugees, Kamla Devi discovered their wonderful gift for craftsmanship. Over the years, the traditional crafts had almost died out. Craftsmen had turned to other professions. <laughs> Kamla Devi traveled to remote corners of the country to meet and encourage them to return to their old professions. She knew that the machine could never compare with human hands. It may give speed and uniformity, but it could not touch the article with creativity. Contribution to the World Crafts Movement her interest in the fruit tradition. <laughs> Amla Devi's work attracted worldwide attention. She was much honored at home and abroad for illuminating so many areas of our life.
a life so rich and multifaceted must surely have a certain sense of fulfillment. One has a certain objective and wants to wait for the goals. One doesn't really achieve all that. And there is so much more that seems to be done. Thank you. Thank you for watching. That was, the last lines are so um, profound. Yeah. Fulfillment means full stop, and that's not realistic. She goes on and on, and I'm sure she already lived so many lives <laughs> in one life. Thank you. Now, I think uh, the audience would like to say something. Uh, Mrs. Veena Jain, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah. Please. I want to say two or three lines, um, not much, because I met Kamla Devi in IIC and uh, had a tea with her. She said, you are from All India Women's Conference. Why don't you sit next to me? She was sitting on a takat, and she said, you sit with me. And uh, she um, uh, ordered for the tea. And her tea separately came in a uh, silver um, uh, teapot and uh, set. So she made the tea for me herself. She said, no, I won't allow you to do. You are my guest. I said, I'm very young. And like, don't worry. I'm also younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very jovial also. Young and hard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to say uh, one or more thing that uh, uh, nobody has touched the um, uh, her handicraft in Katha. Katha embroidery, uh, my samdhan, she called my samdhan Asha Gupta, and she said, you revive Katha. Now, Katha, if you see the Katha of uh, that time, uh, Asha Gupta has uh, four or five pieces. Then you can see one, one bed sheet must be costing four or five lakhs. It's a beautiful the, uh, katha which we are seeing these days that is all distorted and that is not real katha. So I saw that real katha and um, uh, she was the person, Mrs. Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, who revived the katha embroidery also. And Nina Ji, I want to tell you one thing that she was living um, in a uh, canning lane, three canning lane, if I am not wrong. Number one. Number was three. And uh, um, I was living very close by, it's a one minute uh, uh, walk. And unfortunately, when she passed away, I was the one who put her uh, last read on her because that day, um, AIWC office was closed. So uh, my uh, president rang up and she said, why, Bina, why don't you go? I said, OK, I will. Go. And that day was a, I, uh, but I had an opportunity to touch his feet and uh, took her Ashirvan. And these are my experience. And uh, after listening all these people, somehow I reached on those days when I met her. So this is my two, three experience with her and wonderful person, wonderful voice, wonderful person, I can say only. Very, very, uh, her voice was very strong and uh, uh, we can say uh, authority. So very nice person. Thank you very much. Give me the opportunity to explain. Two, Thank three you. Minutes. Thank you, Bina ji. That was so touchy to hear that you laid the last tweet. Priyamvada is here. Priyamvada Chadda. 
she would like to say something. Oh, yeah, Priyamada. Priyamada. How are you? Priyamada? Please go ahead. Please Priyamada, unmute. Are you there? Yeah, she's there. Yes. And what I would just like to unmute. add is that, I mean, actually, good evening, everyone, first. Yeah. And what I would like to add is that she was a very good friend of my Aji's, Anusuya Bai Kale. I don't know if the family remembers that. But I have this book with me that. Anusuya Bai Kale was also our past president. Gee. And my grandfather wrote a book on my grandmother where Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay ji has been mentioned. And I mean, what he says is that they were very good friends and they would write letters to each other and discuss what AIWC was up to. So this book he wrote in 1962 and it talks about their friendship. What's the name of the book? Can you? It's in Marathi actually. It's called Anusuya Bai Animi. Yutika ji, that will come when uh, in October. Okay, uh, yeah. We have on 22nd October, Anusuya, the 20th yes, president. Yes. She was the 20th. So. so that's how I discovered because in trying to research my grandma, mm -hmm. she passed away when I was three, so I didn't know her at all. But I started researching and I told Sheila ji, I said they were very good friends apparently. Yeah, yeah. And I remember Kamla Devi ji coming to my parents' house also. And as a small child, I have a recollection of, I mean, an image of hers. She was special, yes. Good, good. Dear. Excellent presentation. Yeah. I mean, I it just sort of drew us all into it. Really nice. Yeah, takes us down memory lane, yeah, and the achievements, yeah. yeah. I mean, she came alive for the last two, three hours. She was just alive in this room. So nice. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Thank you. Anyone else who would like any, uh, our patrons? Uh, anyone well, who? I just wanted to add when Priyamada said, um, yeah, uh, so many, uh, uh, you know, she's been to so many people's houses, etc. We keep meeting people and they say, oh, you know, when I had this posting in brief, she was there and then we hear a story. Mm -hmm. And then I say, oh, okay. And it's, so fantastic that this one person was shared by so many in so many ways. Touched. You know, she had so much to give. Yeah. That's what I wanted to ask. Definitely. Amazing lady. Yeah. Hello, Yutika Ji. Can you hear me? I'm Padma yes. Kia. Yes, yes, that. we can hear you, Padma Ji. Yeah, I just want to share one little thing. You know, I tagged along with my father, with uh, Kamala Devi Ji, to uh Kanjivaram, where she just visited ah. the, the weavers and the weavers and all that and uh, i was so quite impressed she was not only interested in the art and the interest she showed about the artisan was really touching you know in those days the weaving this thing was not very comfortable there is a pit in which the leg will be under this and it's not a very comfortable position she uh -huh. noted that and she asked them i said this is what is really very a human touch in everything, you know. She is not uh -huh. only an appreciation of art and uh, spread the art, but she was very much concerned about the artist also. Just I just wanted to share it. That was really a wonderful experience for me to thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would like to say one more thing about the exact same thing. All uh, the okay. artisans that we visited as children, many, many, many of them, treated her with a great deal of reverence. But, um, and they listened to her. Sometimes she would scold them because the quality of what they were producing was not good enough. Or sometimes she would praise them and you could see uh, that they took it all very seriously. And when she said to them in a meeting that this is what I'm going to do for you, this is what we're going to develop. And this is, they took her 100% seriously because they knew she would do it. Because she had come in for them before and I've met people years later at, at craft shows and everything. Oh, Kamla Devi, she was like our God. We just, you know, like, and grandfathers would be there and fathers would be there of these young boys running these shows. And they'd say, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. It's, you know, we were so sad to hear she had passed away. And she really, really connected with the craftspeople.
that was her main thing and i i really appreciated that and i learned a lot from it you know that was amazing that was it that was so nice to hear uh, the spectrum she created in craft you know from right from the bottom from the first person the weaver to the fashion that she created is amazing you know i mean goes i i can't comprehend that that situation how she could do that yeah um, put all the uh, craft indian craft at the top as a fashion industry you you look at the delhi crafts council one of okay. the top most talk of bonga to settle for so i think we are at the end of the program do we have the permission to close now yes vote of thanks yeah i would request supriya bhale rao supriya the one who creates beautiful uh, flyers the invite that you saw uh, okay. everyone got it in their phones the <laughs> one who creates is supriya and uh, thank you request, uh, supriya because whenever you do that's a touch a magic touch in your hand everyone looks at oh this is amazing you know that flyer that the colors that you use reminds me of kamla devi you know <laughs> oh supriya <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so thank you uh, thank you thank you yutika for those kind words and uh, giving me the opportunity to deliver vote of thanks formal vote of thanks uh friends uh, firstly i thank uh, sheila ji for for starting this amazing webinar series this has happened to her accidentally but then she gave a nice shape to it and we all continued with it today uh, we are on the 17th president mrs uh, kamla uh, devi chattopadhyay and um, sheila ji i must tell you that sheila ji puts in a lot of effort in each episode she dresses out the family members and people who have worked with that particular president this time she reached out to our speakers uh, arundhati and uh, 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 neena with the help of mrs vajra rao the patron of our mangalore branch she also has arranged a mock meeting for this particular webinar she monitors all the recordings and uh, filing of these webinars also thank you sheila ji for all that effort Uh, I thank uh, our Secretary General, Mrs. Kuljit Kaur, and our Treasurer, Mrs. Rehana Begum, for uh, involving them themselves fully and giving constant support to this series. Now I have to thank profusely today's speakers, Mrs. Arundhati Chattopadhyay, Chattopadhyay, the granddaughter-in-law, and Mrs. Nina Menon for their uh, their granddaughter, her granddaughter. for their excellent presentations which transferred us into that period straight away the stories of our illustrious president uh, kamla devi's life are really really interesting and fascinating indeed thank you arundhati and meena uh, we have with us today mr neel who is uh, mrs kamla devi's grandson he has done a lot of groundwork for these presentations thank you very much mr neel we are really grateful to all of you arundhati neel and neena i i thank our next speaker who came from outside professor josna tiwari for telling us about all about uh, her cultural journey kamla devi ji's cultural journey and uh, you know what her contributions now i thank dr yutika mishra our mic mic mcm library of aiwc for that wonderful and detailed presentation on our 17th president particularly her involvement in aiwc and her work as a social reformer i also thank yutika for arranging one of our speakers that is professor josna tiwari uh, thank you yutika I thank Mrs. Krupa Shetty, our standing committee member from Mangalore branch, for giving us an excellent presentation on Kamla Devi Ji's Mangalore connections, and which was actually her native place. Thank you, Krupa Ji. It was wonderful to know the detailed journey in Mangalore of uh, Kamla Devi Ji. And I thank uh, Ranjana Gupta. Sorry, am I right, Ranjana from our uh, MCM yeah. library? Is she Gupta? 
I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ranjana. Yeah, Ranjana. thank you, Ranjana. thank you, Ranjana thank Gupta, you. for making the documentary available to us today. It was a wonderful documentary, and we have really a mine of knowledge in our library. Thank you once again. I thank. Uh, our patrons, Mrs. Veena Jain and Mrs. Veena Kohli, to be present at the webinar. I saw a lot of guests today with us. I saw Mr. Melkani, Ms. Linda Hopwell, and Anju Kabra, Priyamada Chadda, who is the architect of our Ashiana project, Old Age uh, Home, and uh, uh, Mr. Shivraj Kale who are grandchildren of our another past president, Mrs. Anusuya Bai Kale. Uh, I thank patron Binaji, Priyamada, and also Mrs. Padma Venkat Ramanji for sharing their nice experiences with us. I thank you all vice presidents, zonal organizers, members in charge, and all others for being with us today. I'm very sure you all must have enjoyed this webinar to the fullest. Yutika has been a wonderful host, and I thank Yutika on everyone's behalf. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Yutika. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Yutika and Supriya. Yeah, thank you so much. Keep in touch, and for our next webinar on 17th September on Shrimati Hansa Mehta, our 18th president. Ah. Thanks again. Don't miss that. 17 September, Hansa Mehta. Yeah. In your diaries, yeah. Lovely Calendar. presentations, uh, Yutika. Presented you. very well, very informative. Thank you. Oh, Masai, we have really enjoyed. It, it was, was nice fun. to hear Nina also, because we could go back to that time when Nina was talking about those dolls and all. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Kunji. It was fun doing this program. With yeah. You. yeah, let's let's have a tea party one day. Yeah. <laughs> but there are we can't wait. I wish we could have one. Yeah, soon maybe. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Bye bye. So we close. Stay bye. safe, everybody. Thank Stay you. safe. Thank you all. Stay, Stay healthy. Bye bye. Stay safe.